so I thought we'd chat about just some different paddling routes in and around the area. And this is one of these topics that, um, you know, there's a million places to go once you start to discover what's, uh, what's out there. Um, but I'll, I thought I'd chat about kind of the two areas that I know really well, which is Georgia Bay, where I originally started getting into, into sea kayaking, and then Lake Superior, which I do quite a bit, I've done for, for many, many years. And it's, it's definitely my favorite place to go. So I always like chatting about why it's definitely worth the, the drive north uh, to Lake Superior. Um, so the goal with this is not, is to try to stay out of the real boring stuff, you know, turn left at the sign and turn right, like kind of that level of directions. This is more just kind of inspirational and kind of talk about a couple of the big routes and what makes them really good. And then you can start your own research once you get inspired uh, for that. So that's kind of the idea around it. And there's a million other places to go, but let's start with these ones here. So there's my, uh, my buddy Ray, who we've done lots of trips together over the years. Uh, this is this just a particular photo before we get started. This is up on Spear and that's Cascade Falls, which is a famous waterfall for some old Bill Mason films that you might have seen when you were a young ladder lass that he highlighted, he talked about quite a bit. So let's start with some with Georgia Bay and Georgia Bay is uh, it is a fantastic place to go. It's really accessible, especially for sea kayaking. And this type of stuff you could still do for canoeing uh, almost all these trips, because um, that's what everybody did before sea kayaking became popular. Uh, and Georgia Bay is great. So let's just chat real quick about what makes it fantastic for people who've never been there. And it's got thousands of islands. That's what it's known as. In fact, it's known as collectively as the 30,000 islands. And they, they feel that it's somewhere between there. It depends on how you define an island. But like that photo there's tons of places to go and everything from like just like rock pieces to big giant islands um and you've got 5800 square miles of, of stuff to paddle around so there's kind of an infinite number of places to go and so it just makes it really interesting navigation can get really tricky but the other thing that makes georgia bay really great is it's all rocky and this is really different from people who have come from, say, a, uh, a canoe camping background where you're going to Algonquin Park and you're in the forest. This is totally different in that you're camping on rock and it's as smooth as uh, smooth as glass. And it, I really enjoy it. It's 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 hard to go back to interior camping once you've done this style here because at the end of the trip you're still clean. You're not camping in mud or you're not sitting in pools of water. Um, but and the rocks look great. I mean, they were scraped super smooth when the glaciers retreated and uh, you end up with these really interesting rock patterns uh, almost everywhere you go in Georgia Bay. So it's all about the rocks. And then the other part is it's, as you know, it's got world-class camping. It's got fantastic campsites, um, rocky outcrops, great views. Um, and, and you're, the fact you're, you're camping on rock, it just makes it way easier. Uh, it's often really breezy, so you tend, if you get into some of the outer islands, the bugs aren't quite as bad, but again, that's very relative uh, from that perspective. So um, it depends on obviously when you go. So yeah, so the camping is is world class. Also, with Georgia Bay is really cool because there's tons of shipwrecks. So for people who are interested in the history side of things, there's uh, 212 known shipwrecks. A lot of them are in the Tobermory area and a lot are in the Perry Sound area just because there was so much shipping in those two particular areas. And Tobermory, what is just historically a lot of ships sank just due to the real bad storms that get in that area. So for people who are interested in that, uh, that's pretty that's pretty cool. It's it's a pretty unique spot from for plants and, and animals in that you things got massasauga rattlesnake, snake, you've got fox snakes, uh, hog no snake uh, and, and lots of turtles it's just an environment that's really uh, there's a lot of wild small light wildlife and a lot of these are unique to this one particular area and it's so unique that the it's been named uh, united nation named it uh, a biosphere reserve so biosphere reserve is basically a designated area that has both cultural history and natural history uh, that makes it unique for other areas there's uh, uh, a bunch of other ones across Canada as well, and uh, Georgian Bay Biosphere is one of them. All right, so so where to go paddling in Georgia Bay? There's really, in one level, anywhere where there's water, you could go paddling. But if we think about different areas, then we... Uh, we, uh, who, we just got to see about muting this. 
Uh, you could just double check, just mute your phone, your, uh, let me, all right, so, so if we just think about, there's kind of four big areas, so we've got that, where the paddling is better than other places, I found this, the southern end of Georgia Bay has got a lot of cottages, so it's, it's pretty to paddle, but if you're interested in kind of the camping side of it, then uh, generally stay out of the bottom area, mainly because there's a lot of cottage ownership. Uh, it's not as much crown land, but the, the northern end, the kind of four big areas. So Tobermory is really great for day paddles and that type of thing. Uh, it's, it's spectacular because of the rocks. Perry Sound area is the real jumping off point for certainly people coming up from southern Toronto because it's really easy to get to. And this is probably the, the first kind of wildernessy area to that you can get easy access to. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of that in a sec. French River is at the north end, and it's a wonderful place if you've never been up there. And then the other classic spot is Killarney. So if we get into the Perry Sound area, you've kind of got three really, really good obvious places that I'm thinking somebody who's wanted to get into it for the first couple times. Uh, think about going out of Perry Sound. Logistically, it's easy to get to, and uh, it's easy to get out onto the bay. So you've got three classic spots. There's two provincial parks, so Massasauga Provincial Park at the bottom end. It's uh, a big giant area within here that gives you access to uh, the bay. It's proper, but you can go inland and follow a whole chain of smaller lakes that are connected together. And some places that for canoers, it's a great spot you can get back and you can portage back into some places. But uh, Massasauga is a wonderful, for somebody starting to get into wilderness camping, it's a great spot. Uh, Kilbear, just at the top is also a popular spot for campers. It fills us up really fast, but you get uh, access to getting out on the bay and still being able to car camp uh, if that's your type of thing. Uh, uh, Massasauga is just wilderness camping, so uh, they don't really have the same type of car camping type of facility. For people who are ready to get out of that world, and then Franklin Island is and Franklin Island, Franklin Island area is classic and really easy to get to uh, place. Um, and so let's just chat briefly about, let's jump into Franklin Island. So this is our first trip and this is a, a great spot to go if for sure, I would think about this as a wonderful beginner, maybe just a uh, beginner or above. Um, there's a little bit of a crossing, but you've got options if it's too windy. So you could think about there's kind of two places that you can leave out of. There's a Snug Harbor and there's Dillon Cove Marina out of this area. And you can park the car and you can easily leave out of that, um, out of there. And you got options as far as whether you want to just go around Franklin Island. This is a wonderful little weekend, two night trip that you have a little bit of accessible stuff on the outside, but then on the inside, uh, you can get away from the wind. If you're looking for something a little bit longer, then you can, uh, you could go out and you could do them next to the McCoys. And so the, the idea with the mix of the McCoys is that you can, there's a crossing here of uh, about five kilometers. So you're looking at probably half hour or so uh, to cross out. And then out of there, there's a whole chain of islands that you can go out uh, called the Minks and the McCoys that you can, that are all connected together and really close. And you can just work your way up the whole uh, chain right up to the very top. So this could be, uh, let's just see down at the bottom here. Your longest crossing is about five kilometers and your trip length is probably anywhere from two to four days, depends on how fast or how slow you, uh, you want to go with it. Okay. The, the, um, so yeah, so that's, so that's a, that's a really great route, especially once you get down towards the bottom down here and you cycle your way up once you get out here. So just make sure before you do it, that before you do your crossing, that obviously you're going to check for storms and wind and that type of thing, but it's a nice little rounded route. And if it ends up being too windy, you can always go up the outside of Franklin, or you could hug the backside of Franklin, or you can change your route or go in the opposite direction. There's lots of options. So I would look at this as kind of a really good, uh, just a step above beginner, uh, somebody who's comfortable on the water and comfortable doing a crossing, uh, but you could address that, um, you know, through some practice, but uh, lots of campsites out there and not, it's not super crowded, um, but it's, it's definitely one of the more popular areas 
um, that are out there, but there's so much crown, it's all crown land, so you can camp anywhere you want. So that's my first big one, the Minx and the McCoys. It's kind of a real classic. It's just a couple photos around the Franklin Island area, and there's uh, rocks that are carved out. You got those great classic Northern Ontario uh, red pines and white pines. It's uh, lots of uh, scallop rocks due to the, uh, the glaciers retreating. And then it's wow. out on the Minx, it's certainly nice and dark. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So if we go farther north, one of the other trips I want to highlight up in the French River area, and this is, it's, it's, the nice thing about this is that it's, you're now starting to leave most of the people behind because most people are going to get out and do something in Perry Sound. So if you want it a little bit more remote, then the French River area is, is great. There's a bunch of stuff that can happen out of here. This is a wonderful area for, um, uh, you can also at the top, let me just back up here. So inland is a provincial park, French River Provincial Park. And so there's coming down the French River, there's a lot of canoeing and there's a lot of areas for people who are into canoeing, you can go and kind of hide away from the wind. And then for sea kayaking, you can get out on the bay a little bit more. And so one trip I, I like to, uh, I really enjoy, is, and this is definitely for intermediates, the Bustard Islands is a really accessible route. There's several different ways that you can get to it. And the one that I really try to, uh, there's kind of two ways that you can get there is you could go out at Key River which uh, the Highway 69, where it crosses, there's a bunch of marinas and you basically just paddle straight out the channel at Key Harbor and you go straight across. And the other one is to go out of Brit, which is, uh, well, to even call it a town is barely there, but it's uh, six houses and a dog type, type place. But you can launch out of Brit and there's a big inlet, they're right, uh, right beside each other. And you can then paddle, you can paddle out of it, you can go north up to the, up to the Bustards. Uh, Key River, the reason why, Key River is one of those trips, like that stretch, you're looking at probably, uh, it's about 20 kilometers, and it's one of those things that everybody does once, and then they don't do it again, because it's, you either got a super strong headwind going one way or the other, and it's kind of a long, boring paddle, so you can get a, you can get a, um, a shuttle out there, uh, with some boats and that's a nice way that you can speed up a lot of time and then your trip starts here and you can continue farther or you can work your way up through these channels a lot more so you can get a trip out to, uh, shuttle out to key harbor and then go that's definitely a viable option but the, i've often done it and i run out of the bottom here and we just go north there's some really nice spots to camp uh in the churchill and the Cham champlain islands oh it's really nice and you work your way up behind these islands and then if the weather's good you either make a beeline straight up to the Bustards um, or you can work your way up and around and then it, it all depends on kind of the, the conditions. So you're looking at kind of about um, 60 to 70 kilometers is kind of an out back, depends, uh, that's kind of its longest distance. And you're looking at kind of a nice uh, three day trip. If you want to poke around and go real slow, then you could be five days is, is, is a typical thing. Uh, if everything comes together, three days uh, can work, but it's a, definitely a little bit more of a push trip. I would think of this as an intermediate trip. So somebody who's comfortable uh, going out that long, but comfortable, this upper north section is fairly shallow three years. So if it gets windy, then uh, the conditions can kick up fairly quick. So you just would want to have the condition uh, skill level to match what you're out paddling in. Um, and if it ends up being too much, you can always keep going north and all these channels up in here, you can get lost in there uh, intentionally and there's, you can stay out of the wind. So the, this is where the French river comes out of and comes into the uh, Georgia Bay. So, so that's the Bustard Islands. And, uh, I really like it. Uh, one of the spots you can launch out is there's a small, uh, uh well, it's an ice cream store and they've, there you have a really nice little kind of a front lawn that they use specifically for kayaking. So you can launch out of there and you get pretty fantastic ice cream at the same time. So here's the French River area, and the French River area is unique because it's, uh, I, um, again, it, it, it's a really low line and it's really rocky. So you can see fairly far and it's really long views. So this is out on the Bustard Islands, and it's another low line, it's trees, it's big enough for, obviously, there's a lot of forest out there, uh, but you've got other areas that are really wide open. So with this is the one thing is you definitely want to keep in mind for navigation and kind of keep it on top of where you are because every island looks the same after a while and uh, staying confident in uh, 
yeah, we are definitely at this location. It's really critical for this, but it's a pretty fantastic place to get out to. And you're, you're fairly far offshore, anywhere from about five kilometers in any direction offshore. It's, it's pretty, pretty unique. So then my last trip that I want to highlight just a little bit and uh, or at least kind of in-depth highlight. So we've got, got our, our beginner trip and our intermediate trip at the North shore. Um, and the advanced trip for somebody who's looking like as a dreamer trip, you should think about going out a 12 mile bay and that's the trip to the Westerns and nobody goes here because it's, uh, it's a really tricky spot to get to. So it's probably the most, it is definitely the most remote spot in Georgian Bay and out of 12 mile bay. So it's at the Southern end. So here's Perry sound, Massasauga is here. It's right at the bottom end of, um, kind of, and then you start to get into that Collingwood area around this, or not, sorry, not Collingwood, but you get down into the Honey Harbor area down here. So essentially what it is, it's a little tiny, uh, six or seven little islands that you can barely see on this map. And it's probably at the most about an acre and a half big in total property spread up a bunch of little tiny islands. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky spot to get. So you get off a 12 mile bay exit, drive to the marina, put in, start paddling. And there's a crossing and the crossing is about 15 kilometers. And this is what makes it a really advanced trip and kind of an interesting for someone looking for a challenge. Um, this is definitely the Georgia Bay challenge to get out to. And I like pushing it mainly because not, no one ever goes there except for sailboats and some power boats. It's pretty far out. Um, but essentially you just start paddling and you're there uh, three, three, four hours later and it pops up. And so what's interesting about it is you definitely need to be confident in your navigation because you're just essentially following a bearing uh, uh, to, to know what direction to go in. But what's the cool part about it is that the Westerns, you can't see them from when you first start because it's still below the horizon. And so as you start paddling, you're like, all right, well, we should be going due west. Okay, we'll just keep working our way along. And it's not until you get about halfway or two thirds of the way that you all of a sudden these islands pop up and you go, oh, okay, all right, we're definitely going the right way. But um, it, it's not hard. It's just a bit of a, it's, it, it's a haul to get out there for sure. But the rewards to get out there is well worth it. Look at this. This is a, it's a friend of mine. We went out and we taught a course there a bunch of years ago. And this is the third week of October. So don't go out there in the fall because it's pretty bad. But in the summertime, early spring, it's a, it's a nice time to go. So it's a really low line and it's definitely the most remote part of all of Georgia Bay. There's some of our gang pulling out. Yeah, a big windstorm came in. So we're all hunkered down, freezing cold, but trying to be manly and like, oh yeah, I'm warm and, you know, but we're all freezing cold. So, yeah, so the Westerns, it's, uh, the other thing that's really interesting about it is, uh, is there's a lot of bird life activity out there just because there's no people to kind of shoo them away all the time. And you're, it's, it's got a real remote isolation uh, for it, but it's definitely an advanced trip. You'd want some skill for sure uh, and confidence in paddling. It's 15 kilometer uh, crossing. So it's the, it's a bucket list trip. So these are the three classics in my head uh, with the Minks and the McCoys. It's wonderful. And it's a great trip. If you should think about that for sure, the Bustards, if you're looking for a little bit more of a push. Um, and I really like the Bustards because nobody really goes there. It's a more remote spot. People tend to go over towards Killarney and go out of Killarney. We'll talk about that just briefly, but so I really like the Bustards because it's kind of the forgotten, forgotten child that nobody knows is there. Minks and McCoys, it's definitely busier. You wouldn't want to do that on a long weekend because there's lots of people out doing it, but uh, you go through the week or on an off week and it's much better. And if you really want to get away from people, then the Westerns is where to go for sure. Yeah. So other places in Georgian Bay, just kind of real quick is, um, the, the Tovermori is a wonderful spot if you're looking for, it's kind of a day paddle area. Um, it tends to be because you could go across the, out of Tovermori, you could go across the top, you could work your way down a little bit on each side. This is really remote and super rugged. The tricky part of that is there's very few places to land in a lot of these places. So on a calm day, this is really nice, but you got to be really careful about the wind coming up. Uh, a popular crossing is uh, crossing to uh, Manitoulin um, and get some friends and you essentially follow the ferry channel that goes back and forth. 
and there's a bunch of islands in between that you can hopscotch and work your way up to and it's a nice it's a nice crossing Tobermory is it's really beautiful but there's very few places to camp so what a lot of people do is they camp at the park inland and they plan day trips uh, and out of there uh, Killarney at the top Killarney is definitely you know hiking canoeing country but out on Georgian Bay there's lots of stuff along that shoreline so the Bustards is right here behind the word provincial but you can put in you don't need to go into the town of Clarney, but the provincial park. There's Philip Edward Island, which is a nice area up there. It's, uh, it's compared to 10 years ago, it's really busy. Now there's a lot of kayakers who go out of this area, but it's wonderful. It's beautiful, uh, beautiful area. The other undiscovered territory is the North Channel. So if Clarney is too busy for you, but you don't want to go to Superior, think about the North Channel and that, uh, Spanish is here. So essentially what you do is you go off the edge of the map and you go to uh, Sudbury and then you uh, you work your way across and you can put in either a Blind River or Spanish. Uh, I think this is Espanola in here. And again, there's all kinds of islands through this area and it's wonderful paddling and you'll hardly see anybody. You'll see a lot of sailors. That's because there's uh, world-class sailing up in that area and it's North Channel. It's really famous for that. But paddling, People seem to stop at Killarney, but keep going. It's worth that extra hour's drive, and the experience is significantly more remote, and it looks just like Killarney. So that's my quick pitch around the North Channel, but uh, definitely not a lot of people go there. So yeah, so you've got lots of places to paddle. I would definitely stay out of the southern end of it. Like Collingwood is really nice. Midland uh, at the bottom end is really nice. There's just a lot of boat traffic in all these areas, and it's hard to find places if you're interested in the camping side of it. Um, so I, I tend to stick away from those bottom sections. All right. So let's talk about Superior. And uh, Superior is one of those things that uh, I always tell people that once you get over the pain of driving that far, you realize it is the best thing you'll ever do. And it's hard to come back after you've done a trip on Superior. Uh, and Superior is is pretty fantastic area. And so what makes it super awesome? Well, it's super remote. Not everywhere, but the vast majority of the places that you go are really remote areas. Uh, oh, I've got a question from the audience. So where should we drive an hour from Killarney to paddle? I'm not sure what you mean. So where should we drive an... Oh, oh, to get to North Channel. So, so essentially, like if you're planning to go to Killarney, you should... I always encourage people, if you're looking for somewhere new, drive an extra hour, go north, you still go up to 69 instead of pulling off and going into Clarney, you continue going to Sudbury and it's just off the map. And then you go across towards Sault Ste. Marie. It's about an extra hour of driving and you'll end up in Spanish. And there's several little towns along this area that you can jump off from. But Spanish is kind of the most popular because you can go one way or the other. Uh, but in this area, there's lots of uh, islands in that area. So it's kind of worth the extra hour drive just because everybody stops at Clarney. Does that work? Yes, thank you. Sorry to interrupt your presentation. No problem at all. No problem at all. So yeah, so Lake Superior this is what I really like about it. It's really remote. There is um, a lot of empty land up there and not a lot of development. The other part that due to the fact that it's really remote, there's a lot of history and I love history. I'm a real nerd for that type of thing. Um, I love especially areas that have this kind of industrial history. This is something that I really enjoy. So there's I, I tell people it's kind of one of those places that you can still touch history because it hasn't been wrecked by people. So you've got shipwrecks out there. You've got trapper cabins from like the thirties and the twenties. There's pictographs that are up there. Um, we'll talk about a couple of those places. Uh, you go around the corner and there's like this pictograph and it's, you know, hundreds of years old. There's places that Ray and I found abandoned grave sites that nobody really knows, but they're well over a hundred years old. Uh, and there's ghost towns. Like, there's all this really cool stuff. And essentially the theme is that over the years, uh, humans have gone to try to conquer Lake Superior and make money and they've all gone home bankrupt and broke and you know, their tails between their legs. So there's all this like failure of industry, which makes the whole thing really interesting. And then you got all the other side of for people who are into Canadian history. You've got the, uh, the rail line that goes across the top North shore of, the, of it. 
of Lake Superior, and it's you know was the one of the key pieces that connected Canada together. So it's all this weird history that people are into uh, that I really enjoy. So. You know, the top photographs there is this really remote campsite. You're highly unlikely to see anybody, unless you're in Lake Superior Provincial Park, you're unlikely to see anybody while you're out. Uh, in this bottom photo, this is uh, a trip that I guided up there, and there's a train, uh, what was that? That's a, a steam tug that Captain Jim uh, sank in 1902, and it's still, that's the boiler for it. Way back here, there's another shipwreck that was scuttled, uh, Billy Blake, and uh, from the 1940s. And it, all that's left is just a metal hull, uh, like the ribs of it. All the, it was wood with metal inside holding it together and they burned it. And it was all rotten out. So it's kind of scuttled there. So it's just really interesting stuff like this that I love. So the other part is you got miles of shoreline. Just going around it is 2,700 kilometers. If you want to include all the islands that are in the middle, there's another 1,600 kilometers of shoreline. So there's a, a tremendous amount of uh, empty empty shoreline. So I'm researching this thing and I stumble upon this super cool little fun fact. Uh, Lake Superior has got one of the highest retention lakes uh, in the sense that when water flows into the lake it takes a long time for that water drop to flow back out and they feel that the whole lake takes 191 years to basically be replenished completely um, just because the lake is so deep and it's so full of water. Uh, it's so big. So it's 191 years for the average drop to flow back out again, which I thought that's pretty cool. Downside of Lake Superior, it's friggin' cold. It's uh, it's outside of the last half of August. It's You'll swim, but your knees will definitely be numb by the time you start wading in. So, so there's a lot of trips, and there's trips that you can do that are great for beginners and trips intermediate and advanced. And, and then there's trips for beyond that. Um, but a beginner trip, which is great if you're wanting to kind of dip your toes in the whole thing, it's definitely dry suit uh, weather up there for sure. Uh, somebody had a question around that. Um, you don't have to, but you know, you get lots of foggy, rainy days. Uh, this photo here, this is a classic, you know, I did a trip with Ray two or three years ago and it was a, I think an eight day trip and five of them were just like this. So it's kind of, can get kind of cold and miserable, but it's pretty cool. Uh, but definitely dry suits, um, for sure. Uh, so the Slate Islands, this is uh, one of a really, really interesting spot. So it's way up at the top, and it's just out of Terrace Bay. And it's, a, it's essentially, it's a group of islands right out in the middle of, uh, in the, in the middle of Lake Superior. And what I really like about this, what makes this a really nice beginner trip um, is because you can, you could paddle out to the islands or you can get a shuttle out. In Terrace Bay, there's several uh, companies that will shuttle you and all your boat, all your gear, and they'll get you out there. So it gets past the worst part of it. The crossing for somebody with intermediate skills, you can definitely do it, but um, you could take a shuttle if you want. And then once you're out there, you have options, lots of options of stuff to do. So because there, it's a group of islands, you can hide out in the middle if the storms, if it's really windy, or if it's a calm day, you can go around the, or calm couple days, is you can go and explore on the outside. So this uh, accommodates a whole pile of skill set range, depending on what people want to do. You could go for, I would say probably, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of work and money to get up there. So you're going to want to probably go for like four days. Uh, if you're up there thinking I'm going to fill 10 days, you probably get pretty bored by that. So kind of a four or five day trip is really cool. Probably want to budget two days to go around the whole thing. Um, with lots of time in the middle to poke around. So yeah, there's, there's cool stuff. There's lots of campsites. I didn't mark them all cause you know, but there's lots of places to camp. So you could poke around on the inside and check out all the different channels. There used to be a lot of caribou out here. There's not quite as much anymore. There's just a handful of it, um, but there's lots of caribou trails everywhere. So you can hike and you can get in, into the interior of this fairly easy. Um, as long as you stay on the, the, the super windy caribou trails, um, you can go back to some of these lakes. And a lot of people will take a shuttle out and they'll spend the week fishing. That's a real popular thing there. So there's lots of campsites. It's got, uh, it's home to two mines that are up there, abandoned mines from around the turn of the century. And you get out there and you think it's going to be a big thing and it's really not. It's just like a tunnel that goes 30 feet into the, into the rock. Um, but it's scary and spooky and really cool. So it's, uh, so there's a lot of uh, history uh, in that area as well. And there's a lighthouse at the southern tip, and we'll take a look at some of that. 
so yeah, so the, the Slate Island Lighthouse is really cool to go check out. Um, at the very, essentially right at the water level is the, where the, uh, the mechanical stuff that keeps it going, uh, and the lighthouse keepers, but then the light is at the very top of this big hill and you can, uh, you can hike out and you can hike up to the top of it. And that's, it's kind of cool to check out. It's the highest, it's, I think it's the second highest lighthouse on the Great Lakes, just as pure like height above the water, um, just because they had a convenient hill to throw it on. So, so it's kind of really cool to check out. There's uh, a bunch of cabins that are in there. There's a couple of people who own cottages out there. Um, but this particular one that's kind of smack right in the middle is uh, the classic spot where a lot of people go and visit. It's an old um, M&R natural resources ranger's cabin. And it's kind of dilapidated and it's kind of cool to check out. We set up a little shop on the deck. And yeah, so you could camp there for a couple nights. Uh, or you can move around if you want. There's, but there's a lot of beaches and this beach at the bottom is kind of real classic uh, Lake Superior type beach with some sand and a lot of cobblestone is, the, is, is really what it looks like. But you're unlikely to find, you might, you found when we went there a couple of years ago, we saw uh, two guys who were fishing there for the week and they were just sticking in the center part of it. Otherwise we didn't see anybody the whole time we were out there. There's a lot of uh, history. We talked about the man uh, in this particular place is there's kind of recent history, a hundred years old. And then there's a uh, North Shore Superior is what's known as the Puckasaw Pits. And this is what I get super jazzed about. And I think these are really cool. Um, and they're very unique to this region of the North Shore Superior. And essentially what they are, as it said, they're just depressions in the rock left by early inhabitants by ancestors of the Ojibwe who live in that area now. And which you can see in this photo, it's really hard to kind of see, but essentially this is just a pile of rock that's been piled around. This is probably six or eight feet across. And mm -hmm. the bottom one you can see here is from the side, it's all piled up and it's a big giant donut. In this case, there's a plant growing in the center. And uh, they're just called Puckasaw Pit. Sometimes they're built up, sometimes they're hollowed out, um, but you can, you can uh, uh, hear them right away. Jeff, you gotta mute your mic. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can figure it. Did they just do it? <laughs> yeah. Nope. So the uh, what's interesting about them is they were discovered. Well, not discovered, but they were noticed um, by uh, a researcher from U of T back in about the 1930s. And so he was kind of walking along some of these beaches and was like, "What's this thing sitting here?" And they tend to be up high, right next to the tree line, and nobody really ever noticed that they were there. And they so they don't really know what they're for because the people who First Nations who live in that area these predate them, so they don't really know what they are. Uh, I think they, like it's, it's written here, it could be like a hunting blind, maybe a food storage, uh, some type of spiritual site that no one really knows. But what's cool about them is they're anywhere from 400 to potentially 5,000 years old. Um, from So the archeologist side of it, people love them. So they're really cool to check out. Um, it's kind of one of those top secret things that just, there's a people who know where they are, but they don't really advertise. So you just kind of stumble upon these things. You're like, wow, look at that. Um, but yeah. And so then people ask you, it's like, how do you know that that wasn't just piled up yesterday? Um, and the reason why you look at it and you think this looks super old is because all this rock is all covered in lichen. And if you flipped over one of these rocks, the rock is a different color on the other side, just because it's been sun bleach and it's got dead lichen and stuff like that on it. And so if these shift around, you would know they, they would all look, anyways, it's all super uniform that these things have been there for a super long time. And so the way they describe it is they, some are, they say some are old and some are very old. That's kind of the easy way they describe them. So yeah, so the Pakistan Pits, there's one out there um, and you would see it if you paddled by it. And if you happen to be going out there, let me know and I'll show you where to go. So that's my first one. So the Slate Islands is a wonderful trip. It's a bit of a haul to get there, but it is well worth the drive getting up to the Slates, especially if that was where you first wanted to dip your toes into it. The other one is Lake Superior Provincial Park and it's over to the side. So that whole area is, is a provincial park. It's super famous for hiking, is its primary piece. There's some inland canoeing and then there's kayaking, but it's uh, definitely a hiker's paradise, but you know, we're gonna hike along the edge uh, and paddle it. So there's, uh, there's a couple ways that you could approach a trip on Lake Superior Park. There's a couple drive-in campsites, which are like any other provincial park campsites. And what a lot of people do is they'll park 
and camp there, and then they go out and do day hikes, and the day hikes are uh, could be multi day long uh, for it, but that's what most people go there for. And so lots of people do the same thing with kayaking is they'll just plan different places to access the shoreline. So that's an option for people who might not be into the wilderness side of camping, but want to, you know, car camp. Um, but people who are into multi day trips, you can still do it. So you can put it at the top end of the park. So this, this is the very top. This is Old Woman Bay. You could go either direction, but uh, I had to pick one. So Old Woman Bay, you can put in. And this is 65 kilometers down to Agawa Rock at the bottom. There's some pictographs here. Uh, you could uh, obviously continue farther north or farther south, but this is just one of them. So this is about 65 kilometers, about an intermediate trip because there's some remote areas and you kind of get stuck out on some of the points that are way out here and that can get pretty stormy around them. Um, but a nice, nice, fantastic four or five day trip that you can, that you can paddle and it's, it is well worth, worth that trip. So if we, um, there's a million campsites along this area for sure. I mean, you can buy a map for it and it'll show you where they all are and you can plan it out. So what makes this area really special for sure, the most famous thing in Lake Superior Provincial Park is the Agawa Rock Pictographs, which is where you're going to end your trip. And that is uh, pretty spectacular. It's just a big flat wall with uh, about 10 different pictographs that are on there. You can see there's this one is uh, we got this big famous canoe, which is the logo of the Canoe Museum out of Peterborough. You got some snakes down at the bottom. You got uh, Mishapishu, which is uh, uh, like a trickster spirit, and it's a lynx and uh, it lives at the bottom of Lake Superior, I believe. It causes all the storms. So there's, and there's a whole bunch that you can go to visit and they're pretty, pretty cool. Um, but then the other part is, is just a lot of really remote rocky beaches. And these, the beaches are interesting that right at the water is the big giant boulders and then they kind of get smaller as they often go up farther. So when you're camping up higher, um, there's lots of kind of flat rocky places to camp. So you're not often camping directly in sand, which is nice. Um, otherwise sand gets in all your food and everything, but um, there's lots of, if you want sand, there's places to go. Uh, it depends on what your preference is, but it's, it's still fairly remote. And the nice thing is, is you have the background, like the um, kind of the risk assessment, risk management side of things is if you get in trouble, then you're still in a provincial park and there's places to get out. That whole shoreline um, is a, a hiking trail all along this whole area is the coastal trail that people hike. So uh, there's ways to get out in a bad situation. So here's the cliffs of Old Woman Bay. These are really famous. This is a, it's a big giant beach right there that you can land out and the highway comes down and you can barely stay on the road because all you're doing is looking out over these cliffs here. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Uh, but the one thing is, is definitely is to keep an eye out. It tends to get a lot of winds in the afternoon. Well, all of Lake Superior does, but so you want to potentially plan your trips, kind of break it up and paddle early in the morning and paddle in the late afternoon or the evening and take a, a break in the middle if the winds get too big. That's kind of an easy way that you kind of think about it. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't, especially in the summer, it's far enough north that it gets darker about an hour compared to where I am here in Toronto. It's probably about an hour, 15 minutes later. So you could, it's still bright and sunny uh, at 10 o'clock at night. So you can, uh, you can paddle much later in the evening if you needed to make miles. So kind of keep an eye out for that. Look at those, those cliffs, they're pretty awesome. So that's Lake Superior Provincial Park. And again, you could go, you could do beginner, you could go up to about an intermediate level and it's a wonderful place to go. It is well worth it. Um, and you'll have our time going back, coming back to Southern Ontario uh, for it. Uh, Dog River, this is the other uh, nice trip for sure. and. Uh, you can go Mitch McCotton River, which is just right at the uh, mouth of the, where, the right where Wawa is. And you're out of the park. So this is all crown land and you're on your own. But this is a really nice beginner trip for someone. That, if somebody was just getting started, there's a couple of outfitters up there and they market this as a guided trip for their beginners. Uh, it, it's, it's wonderful. So Wawa is just off the map, just up the top here. And you leave this Mitch McCotton River, which comes down here, and you can launch right out of here. There's an outfitter called Naturally Superior Adventures out of here. Uh, they rent gear, and otherwise you can bring your own stuff. Uh, they have a B and B, so you could stay there the night before and launch the next morning. It's uh, so logistically, this is a really simple trip to plan. So you could you start it off. You're looking at probably 70 kilometers. Five days is super relaxed. 
Uh, lots of people do five days. You can do fours as well, but you want to spend at least a full two nights at the Dog River itself and then work your way back home again. Um, so you cross across the bay. There's a lighthouse that's right at the point there and you can get out and take a look at it and you just work your way across. This is, uh, it's got a lot of sandy beaches, lots of places to pull out. There's virtually no cliffs. So from a risk management perspective, it's, uh, it's, it's really easy from that area. So if it gets bad, you just pull it and start camping at the next, uh, the next beach. But what makes it really cool is that you work your way out to the Dog River and Dog River, oh, there's some pictures of some beaches as you travel along and it's just yeah. sand and rock. So it's, it's different from some of the other areas, which is kind of big boulders. Um, so if this is your thing, this is the place to be. Uh, but there's the Dog River is really famous for a set of waterfalls called Denison Falls. And so when you camp out, you get to the Dog River, you the next day, which is why you want to spend a day there, is you start hiking up. It's about probably about an hour and a half walk uh, through a kind of a sketchy trail. And then you uh, get to the top and it's this big, huge, massive waterfalls that's kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere. And it's well worth it. So you're probably, you know, spend the whole morning, part of the afternoon and you work your way back and yeah, it's a, makes for a wonderful day. Uh, this a vertical height for the Denison Falls, this is, these photos are a bit deceiving. Vertical height is higher than Niagara Falls. So they're substantially big, but the, what makes it deceiving is that they're far back. So they tear down, kind of cascade down a whole set of, and in both of these, these are fairly low uh, water levels. So I've seen it come over where it's twice as big as that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty spectacular spot. So these are kind of my three, three uh, famous trips. And again, are really accessible for people who are just wanting to get started into this. Um, so the Slate Islands, I think it's well worth the drive getting up there. There's lots of really interesting stuff to paddle. Even around Terrace Bay, the small towns on either side of that, there's really, you can make a wonderful uh, two week trip out of that, that whole region with uh, four or five days of paddling. Dog River, uh, anybody just getting started, go to the dog. It's wonderful. Don't go to the dog because it'll get busy for when I want to go. Uh, but, and then the other one, Old Woman to Egawa Bay is another classic, classic route through the uh, Lake Superior Provincial Park. And of course, uh, get close right to the very end for these guys is there is an infinite number of places that you can go. Uh, for and it all depends on what you're looking for so just at the very top here just kind of really quick just highlight them is there's a, a section here called between Rossport which is another small little town to Marathon it's a wonderful trip um, it's got lots of you go through some ghost towns you follow along the train line that's uh, that's, that's there that's, uh, it's it's it's, it's it's pretty spectacular, it's pretty spectacular, for, spectacular sure. for sure. Yeah. yeah. So let's, uh, someone's just, somebody just needs to mute their mic there. So anyways, that's a really one. It taps into a lot of history. There's a lot of, uh, the, um, the Canadian, the, mm, who were the painters, the group of seven, they've done a lot of painting up in that Northern area. So people are into that type of thing. That's the place to go. Uh, if you're looking for a really wilderness experience, 10 to 12 days, the Pakistan coast, Still goes from Marathon all the way to Wawa. This is the uh, one of the most remote parts of of the of Lake Superior for sure. Uh, once you get into day two, you won't see anybody until you hit the Dog River at the end of the trip. So there's a significant number of time that there's no one out there. It's really remote. It's pretty cool. Uh, probably eight days if you're racing. I would say probably you want to budget ten days for that for that trip. So that's a big one. Um, the other one that's really remote is often known as the whale tail just because of the shape of the land that's up here but you could paddle straight from thunder bay or you could put in at the bottom of a giant a sleeping giant provincial park and you basically just run this whole coastline all the way to rossport um, it's fairly remote uh, there's a lot of cottage not a lot of cottages but there's, there's cabins along the way so there's uh, that type of thing. There's some sailing in that area, but oh, it's it's definitely. I've never done it, but it's high on my bucket list. I've stared at the photos a lot. If you go to the U.S. side, there's two uh, really interesting places. There's the Apostle Islands, which is down in the bottom corner down here. Uh, if you're planning a road trip, then the Apostle Islands is 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 really neat. It's just a small archipelago of islands, and it's all out of sandstone, so it's a lot of sea caves and that type of thing. 
uh, sculpted rock. There's no, it is not remote in any way. There's a lot of day trips. You could just rent kayaks and go out and do it, but uh, it's it's pretty beautiful area. And then the last one, which I really always try to hype up, is the Pitchard Rocks, which is right along this bottom section uh, out of Munising. And you could go either way. It's not super remote, but it's gorgeous. Um, where the North Shore is all about granite and, and uh, you know, trees. The South Shore is all about sandstone and sand dunes. It's a really kind of an interesting, essentially when the glaciers retreated, they just dropped a giant sandbox of stuff in that whole place and crushed it and turned it into sandstone. So what you've got are these cliffs for 10 or 15 kilometers, uh, almost 20 kilometers, and the cliffs are 8 to 12 stories high, and they're called the Pitchard Rocks because all the minerals leach out of the sandstone, and it just looks like someone poured paint and it's just running down. And so it's, uh, it's pretty spectacular area to paddle. A lot of people do a lot of photography in that area and there's boat tours and all kinds of stuff. So anyways, it's an interesting, very unique place to go. Um, but yeah, that's the, and then if my final thoughts around Superior, there's so many places to go. You definitely want to do your research and figure out, you know, when should I go and, and gear and that type of thing. So talk to people, find people who have done different trips before and they can give you some tips and advice. But it is, there's a bit of a mystique around Superior that people think it's beyond their skill set. And it is in some ways, but in many ways it's not. You know, you just need to kind of plan, what can I do and where can I go? Uh, that type of thing. So it's kind of practically for Superior itself. So when should I go? I usually tell people, think about it kind of mid-June to mid-August at the latest. Once even, you know, second week of August, you're kind of pushing the limit. It's what happens is it gets very unpredictable. It gets really high winds as the season goes on. Um, it, Lake Superior is definitely not the place to be in September or after that, because you'll probably get windbound and get stuck somewhere. Um, I was up there and we were there right around Labor Day one time. And there was, this is a couple of years ago. And there was a guy who was stuck far down the shore trying to figure out how to get home. And he couldn't get out because he had been stuck like four days windbound. And we were like, why are you here in Labor Day? So, um, but yeah, so we think about mid June to mid August is the best time for that. Uh, and you can, and you know, do I go by myself or do I hire a guide? And you can do either of those. There's lots of uh, outfitters who will, who are offering trips in that area. Um, so naturally Superior is the, they're based right out of Walla, right on the water, as I described. So they're, a, they're the best kind of local guide. And then, uh, uh, James and Dipna, who run the Ontario Sea Kayak Center at Perry Sound, they do trips on Lake Superior as well as, as, well as other places, but they're uh, another place to uh, check out if you're looking from a guided, guided experience, but there's uh, several different other outfitters that are smaller. Then the last big question I get asked a lot is, is you know, so what do we do about waves and wind? And that's really the big factor that's going to affect, uh, affect people who are going out. And you really definitely want to pay close attention to the forecast really paying particular attention to wind, speed, and direction, and that'll help plan out where you're going to go, the, you know, what are you going to do the next day. So you definitely want a radio with you because there's very few places that have any cell coverage up in that area. So you want a VHF to get the marine radio and pay attention to the, uh, the wind and wave forecast. As I said earlier, if, if things are looking bad then, and you need to make miles, then certainly early in the morning is the best time to go before the wind picks up and uh, take a break in the afternoon and the winds tend to dry, dry off kind of, or die off kind of, you know, 3.30 is kind of typical. And so then get back on the water and do a couple more miles uh, and then come in camp late if you have to, but that's an option. And finally, the general rule of thumb that we, we think about when we're, when you're planning trips is you budget kind of one in five days to be windbound. So plan for it. it. It's just kind of a fact of life. And so when I plan, when we plan a trip, we always plan a full second or like a full day's worth of meals that we, you know, we might have to get into. We might not, we might get stuck. So uh, budget, you know, the day you want to leave, you're going to drive up and you start paddling, but you want to in theory budget a day that you don't have to, you don't want to have to force yourself to be back at work the next day. Cause you, you know, what if you get stuck in that and you make a poor choice. So budget a buffer day in that. Um, and maybe you're back a day early. Uh, but, uh, when you, when you plan for it, you'll never need it. So kind of keep that in mind, but one in five is typical. And later in the season, certainly if you went it towards the end of August, then it's like two and five for sure. So things get pretty messy around that time. 
Yeah, there we go. I am all done. Does anybody have any questions? I will be your travel guide. Tell me what you want to know. I have a question. Hello? Yeah, hey, Chris. Hi. So these trips, when you have them down the shore, say, um, to the, uh, the picture rocks and yeah. all of that, and you say four or five days, um, is that what, that's one way, I guess, is it? And, and how do you figure out how to get back? I mean, do you have somebody yeah. to pick you up or? Yeah, so for example, the Dog River, some of these are out and back. So, hmm. uh, so this is kind of five days, you know, spend a night getting out there. So night one would be halfway, night two, night three, then another day coming home. So four nights and you're out there. Oh, so they're all round trip. That's my question. Yeah. yeah. So if you go back to, so Dog River is a round trip. If you go to Old Woman Bay, uh, Old Woman Bay is a one way. So you would need to well, figure out a I, shuttle. So there's some logistics That was the one I was thinking it. about. Yeah. So can you arrange a shuttle up there? Or? Yeah, totally. Um, there's, uh, you can get a shuttle. If, if, if two of you are going up in two cars, then obviously you could arrange the shuttle yourself, get a car at one end or the other and kind of figure out how to make that work. Um, yeah. But Naturally Superior does do shuttles, uh, Naturally Superior Avengers, excuse me, they'll do shuttles for you. So um, you just can talk to them and they'll tell you, give you a price and decide what you want to do uh, yeah. for it. So if you had a single car, they'll move it to the other end. And in the case of, uh, let's go to a full map. If you were doing something like you could leave your car in Wawa, they'll shuttle it up or they'll drive you and all your gear up to Marathon and you mm. just paddle back home again, mm, that's back to your nice. car. Yeah. So nice. they, uh, they're, they're kind of one of the few places that will move you and your boats around. So I would probably start with Natural Superior. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. And then at the Southern end, the same thing. There's lots of services that'll do shuttles for these types of things. You just kind of got to start getting on the horn and doing some research on the old inter internet for sure. Mm. Yeah. Were you saying that we should wear a dry suit always on Lake Superior. What about a wetsuit? Is that good enough? Yeah, or yeah, you could. It, it obviously necessary? depends on the day. I mean, the mm -hmm. water is cold, um, and you know, until dry suits came around, everybody was just paddling in cut off jean shorts. So there's, <laughs> you know, you kind of got to yeah. think about it. In one sense, it's it's the first bunch of trips I did. I was all bundled up in dry suits, and I'd come around a corner, and there would be, you know, a guy, a dog, and a lady in a canoe, and and you know they're just wearing whatever jeans they're wearing. So we're kind of two opposite ends of the safety spectrum there. Um, but yeah, it depends on what your skill level and your comfort level, obviously, for sure. Um, I always bring the dry suit because uh, sometimes we'll just roll it up and stick it in front of my feet and I don't wear it because, you know, it gets warm and it can get annoying to paddle in. Uh, but on rainy, miserable, cold days when the wind's blowing, it sucks not having it. So um, yeah, there's lots of times that I'm glad I brought it for mm. sure, so, but I don't wear it all the time. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, from the Georgian Bay trips, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming not the, the uh, superior, but lots of people do um, canoeing into these areas. Maybe some of it's advanced. Is there anything that's suitable for canoe from what you've shown today? Oh, totally, yeah. Uh, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to a map here. You could do all these trips in a canoe. So, um, but yeah, you, you definitely could. The, the only issue with a canoe, there's no reason why you can't. I mean, they explored all of Canada in canoes. Um, so the only thing is to keep in mind is that you've got a lower threshold for wind speed and uh, wave action to keep in mind. So where a canoe or uh, where a kayak can, you know, hustle through those winds and bigger waves, at a, you know, at a higher level, yours is just lower. So as long as you kind of work around dealing with wind and waves, oh yeah, load that canoe up and go for it. You can do any of these trips with it. In fact, the, the uh, top end of French River is, is uh, especially up in French River Park, it's, canoe is almost advantage because you can come down out of the highway, you can come down French River or one of its tributaries on uh, either side of it, that sea kayaks can't go down uh, just because there's some portages and stuff like that. So uh, it's not uncommon for canoe is to come down, spend a couple days out on the, uh, out on the bay, and then work your way back in. But I, I think I was yeah. particularly interested in the Slate Island potential. Oh yeah, you totally could. I wouldn't canoe out to the Slates, for sure. No, I wouldn't. Uh, it's because 10 kilometers in a canoe in those conditions. So I'd get a shuttle out, but once you're out to the Slates, 
you can go anywhere. In fact, the uh, the two guys that I talked about who were fishing out there, they were quite happy just to fish and drink, uh, fish and drink uh, for it. But they had their little canoe and they were just puttering around. Um, let's just go to it because they were, yeah. So they were puttering. They spent the whole section in the middle. And then if it's calm, if you've got a calm day that you know it's going to be calm for the, enough time, yeah, you can stick your nose out and just start working your way down the shore. You could get down to the lighthouse um, and then start hustling your way back or keep going uh, for it. And if you get windbound, yeah, you're windbound and you get going the next day after that, you know, so. Um, but yeah, uh, canoeing, it's not as common, but lots of people do. Hey, David. Yeah. Qu question? Yeah. Uh um, so you mentioned something about VHF radios. Would you recommend that or would you recommend like a Garmin with like an in-reach, um, mm. like SOS function? I, I definitely would have a radio for sure at the minimum requirements because the radio uh, is a couple things. It's, they're not super expensive. There's no monthly fees. You can talk to the Coast Guard, but you can get the radio, like the weather, and you can get, you can tap into the uh, like the marinas that are in that area and like the fishing. So if you needed to, there's not a lot of that type of stuff up there, but it's a, it's a wonderful tool to have uh, for sure. Um, and for people who, uh, the inReach, they're like a great, they're, it's a fantastic extra security blanket. And I have one and I bring it with me um, and you can use it to, uh, you know, signal for help. You can get the Coast Guard if you needed to with that, or you could send messages back home, find out the gossip, what's going on at home and that type of thing. So inReaches are, they're a wonderful tool for sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's mandatory, but uh, if the budget calls for it, I would put my money into it. And I do, I, I always bring mine. But a radio, I use the radio all the time. Um, and, and a group is really good because if, you, if you're a large group of people and you kind of spread out a little bit, you could sit and talk to each other using the radio, but you know, you kind of want to stick together. All right, people are saying they're hooked on Superior. I'm looking at that chat line. Yeah, you should. I always talk to, <laughs> I always hype up Superior. I, like, like I said at the very beginning, it is, uh, uh, it is a haul to get up there because you're looking like from say Toronto to Sault Ste. Marie, it's 10 hours. So you need a full day of driving to get where you're going. So logistically, it's really hard to make a trip happen, but the payoff is well worth the extra work. Um, that water is crystal clear. And the other, because the water only sits, you know, it only gets three or four degrees at any given point in the year. Um, it's too cold for weeds. And so the outside of the bay, you'd hardly get any weeds growing in it. So it's all just bare rock. So you paddle along and you look down and it's crystal clear and it's just boulders below you. And it's kind of wigs you out until you get used to it because you're used to Georgia Bay or down here where it's kind of a much murkier water. It's super crystal clear water because there's no uh, particulates in that water column, as they say, like you can just see right through it. Um, but it's cold. It's freaking cold water, but it is, it's, it's pretty nice. That's for sure. Cool. Any other last questions? All right. Well, I'm all done. Um, yes, I have a question oh, actually. Right too, under the David. wire. Right yeah, under the wire. I typed yeah. it in, but you didn't see. I was just wondering, please, um, what's a really easy trip for a beginner paddler or somebody who knows how to paddle but just isn't very strong? Like, yeah. what's a okay. beginner trip that's beautiful, please? Where do you want to go? Like, how far do you want to drive? Like, you um, think of Georgian Bay I, or are you thinking like, Farther. I wouldn't mind. I've been around Wawa and Thunder Bay, and I thought Wawa was probably the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. Oh, yeah. To be honest yeah. with you, um, but um, I don't. I don't really fancy being in cold water. Yeah. So probably Georgian Bay would be better. Let's go back to the map. I'm with you. But every time we do a Lake Superior trip when it's done, we're always thinking, oh, we got to go somewhere where the water's warm." <laughs> so, but uh, but we keep getting sucked back into it. So let's go back to my little map here uh, for it. There is a couple, there's lots of really easy places. And it, for somebody who was just getting started, um, I would, I would definitely think about the Franklin Island area is um, like, for example, so if let's just back up here. So if somebody, uh, I would go out, think about Perry Sound area, who was just getting started for a couple of reasons. It's easy to get to. It's only like three hours from Toronto. So from that perspective, it's easy to get to. 
there's a lot of people around. So if something goes wrong, there's lots of people to help you out. So there's a nice um, uh, buffer security blanket out of there. And it's uh, logistically, there's lots of places to go uh, as far as route and there's lots of places to sleep. So you could go to Crown Land, you could go to Provincial Park, you, you, it sucks, you could go back to a hotel. So you've got options to play with. If somebody was just getting started, this is the trip I would suggest. And from here you have options as a beginner say it was your first camping trip ever. I, my kids, I took them here. We did a ring. We did a trip around the bottom end of Franklin Island. It was just a short, my kids are super young. Uh, and it was just a nice gentle trip to get them into it. But someone who's, you know, if you're taking some friends or if it's yourself, I would think about this area. Um, it's not super remote, like, as I said, but it's got uh, lots of options to camp and it's got lots of options. If the wind or you're just too tired, you can go different ways. So that would be my first port of call. Think about the other place is uh, if somebody was getting into it and you're looking for a little bit more remote, but still security blanket, think of the bottom end of uh, Massasauga. Some fantastic swimming holes, lots of rocks to jump off. You don't have to really go anywhere because you're just zigzagging around. So it's not a destination like we want to do miles. Yeah, go here. You just got to book ahead of time. That's the problem with it. So you just got to think about that ahead of time. Otherwise, Franklin okay. Island. Yeah. Okay, great. That Thank one? you very much. Yeah. Kilbear is nice, but it's probably already booked up solid for the whole year. So mm -hmm. you got to think about Kilbear in September. There's no one up there. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. So if you got questions, definitely email me. I've emailed you guys enough times. So send me a note. I'm happy to give you some ideas of what you're thinking about. Uh, we didn't get into gear. We didn't get into that type of stuff. But if you got questions about that world of things, uh, anybody's happy to gab about that. So you could, uh, you could send me a note if you got questions. And if you come back from these trips, definitely tell me because I want to hear about it. Because that's always the best part. I always hear the first part and no one ever follows up. So. Thanks a lot, Dave. Hey, great. no problem. All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming out.